So I would argue just the opposite, that part of going to this new culture of productivity and safety has to include wiring the poor and thinking it through in a very, very specific way. What do we want to do to ensure that fiber optic is available? What do we want to ensure that dish satellites? I talked to a corporation, which is probably going to announce in the near future, that they're going to take a public housing project in Washington, <coughs> and they're going to put a dish receiver in every house, in every uh, <coughs> apartment. <coughs> and they're going to do it as a pilot project to bring 500 channels to the poor, including educational channels, job-seeking channels, learning channels, just to say, all right, I mean, let's have an explosion of knowledge. It doesn't cost much. And if in the process, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, the poorest child in America has access in their living room to the world, and they begin to think, wow, I can be somebody, because I have the same access as anybody else does. You change things. But it's deeper than that. We need to be thinking about safety in the information age, and about health care in poor neighborhoods in the information age. And I'll give you just two, quick, two or three quick examples. <coughs> If you know there are some neighborhoods that are very, very unsafe, one of the things you do is you put cameras out. You find ways to have the kind of surveillance you need to provide real protection. Another step you do uh, is you begin to provide some kind of call device and you, and you get volunteers and you get lots of volunteers. You see something suspicious, call the cops. It's better to have the police arrive early. It's better to have the police arrive early and see what's going on than it is to have them arrive after the crime. Most of the time today, police are crime reaction rather than crime prevention units because you have to integrate them into the neighborhood and have anonymous people who can just call and say, I think there's a teen gang at the corner and I think somebody's going to get hurt in the next half hour. The police then drive by. That Again, you could, give, you could literally give away devices to call in to create a network of information. It ain't that hard to computerize databases. It should, it should be relatively easy to track who are the teen gangs to simply know who's who, to go to thumbprints for a whole range of things, including food stamps and other things. <coughs> and, and, and I'm totally in favor of instant identity for buying guns. I mean, we ought to know if, if somebody who has been in a mental institution or is a convicted felon shows up and they want to buy a gun, I'd like to know that while they're standing there. And I'd like to have policemen visit with them while they're still in the store. <laughs> and say, hi, you know, we, we, we probably want to take you away for a long time. And I would say it ought to be illegal for a felon to try to buy a gun. I mean, I'd put a very high stake. I mean, we're told 70,000 felons showed up and got, you know, we're trying to buy guns. Why are they trying to buy guns? Why don't we drum into their heads? It is illegal. We will not tolerate you buying guns. Isn't it illegal? It's illegal to have bought it, but we just warn them away. Without saying to ourselves, let's make a note here. This is the third time Freddie's tried to buy a gun. I mean, at some point you begin to think, there might be a pattern here. Maybe if something happens in Freddie's neighborhood. And again, when you're out on parole, we could easily have you wearing a, an ankle bracelet uh, that, that was connected by satellite that tracked you precisely the way we track, for example, uh, large mammals and, and endangered species. And while you're on parole, if you happen to be at the local 7-Eleven at the exact second it's being robbed, we might say to ourselves, we know that up to 84% of the people in some cases are going to be recidivists. And yet we do nothing to track them. I mean, these, these things are all, te the technology exists today for a revolution in public safety. Similarly, you can set up very inexpensive neighborhood uh, clinics connected electronically to the best hospitals and the best doctors in the world. And you can have very inexpensive people who are trained to screen up to a point where you then call in the doctor. What we have today is a model that says, if you can't afford to set up a full clinic with full standing doctors meeting every possible requirement of a nice upper middle class neighborhood, we really shouldn't provide any health any care at all. And it's not that hard to build a series of, of things we're doing in the military now where we're going to be able to go from a field unit that has a person who is, who's just been wounded directly by satellite to the best doctor for that kind of wound in the world and get them help immediately. You could do the same thing for the poor at not much money. And you could actually guarantee screening for things, and you could guarantee prenatal care, and you could do things dramatically less expensive than the current model. Beyond the information age, pillar five is deming and quality. The first point I'd make, if you, if, you, if you look at the deming model and you think at a systems level, the first point I'd make is we are looking at a system of failure. Very important principle that it is the system which has failed. 
not just individual cases. And that's why I talk about a replacement of a culture and a replacement of a system. What we want to do is build a system of success with continuous improvement, teamwork, customer orientation, and continuous measurement. So we're constantly finding out are in fact, you know, when, when we're told, well, this school didn't succeed very well, and so 70% of the kids aren't learning how to read, so we'll now have a study plan, and maybe a year from now we'll have a new proposal. In the intervening year, of course, 70% of the kids won't learn how to read. Uh, and then maybe we'll start seeing whether or not there's some improvement. That's crazy. If you have a school that you find out this morning you know has 70% of the kids not learning how to read, the crisis meeting ought to be at lunch. The first new plan ought to be Monday. You ought to be measuring whether or not you're changing behavior by Friday. You ought to be working every day to change things. And yet you've got unionized work rules, you've got tenure, you've got all the impediments to rational behavior. And again, it fits this, the difference in these two cultures. In this culture, you change every day. We have the red bead experiment every day. You work very hard at finding how to do things better. And you're very flexible and creative. In this culture, you fill out the paperwork and it ain't your fault. You did what the bureaucracy told you. Why, why should they blame you? Why pick on you? Totally different models. In this culture, you have only one ultimate test. Are the kids taken care of? Are they safe? Are they learning? Do we have a community doing the right things? In this model, you have only one test. Did I fill out the paperwork so they can't fire me? Totally different models. And, and, and if you take Deming's vision of how quality works and you apply it to the current bureaucracies, it just makes you want to cry. And that's why I don't think you can reinvent them. I think you've got to basically transform the system to a dramatically more decentralized, less government system. In a sense, I guess I'd suggest that we really do have two visions, the welfare state versus what I would call an opportunity society. Now, if you accept the systemic difference, what I would like to suggest to you is that there are seven strategies for implementing the opportunity society. First, holism, and I'll, I'm going to walk through all these. Second, individual and community responsibility and involvement. Third, productivity and safety. Fourth, putting children first. Fifth, creating diverse communities, de-ghettoizing poverty. Sixth, real compassion and volunteerism. And seventh, an effective and appropriate role for government. And again, you have to think of these as seven integrated strategies. All seven of them have to fit together into a coherent whole. Doesn't do you good to do four of them. You need to do all seven. Strategy one is holism. And, and this essentially goes back to my earlier point, that we have to approach the total change of the culture and system. But if you're not looking at the totality of it, if you're not taking a person from here all the way down to here, you're not getting anything. Having an indolent drunk who no longer drinks but, but hasn't changed any other behavior, A, means that within a year they're probably going to start drinking again. 